An auto workers dispute in the U.S. underlines Washington's struggle to become competitive in the global electric car market. While the EU and China clash over subsidies, so is the EV sector becoming the new geopolitical battle? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Delivering affordable electric vehicles has become a priority for global car makers. Huge markets like the EU plan to outlaw the sale of traditional engines by 2035. The move to electric is a revolution for the automotive sector. But like all revolutions, there can be a degree of chaos and unintended consequences too. Well, few might have imagined 20 years ago, China would become the world's top producer of the next generation of motor vehicles. In the US, automotive workers are on strike, partly for fear of big job losses and pay cuts in making EVs. The US has to become more competitive to grab a bigger electric vehicle market share. Among their supporters, the US president, who says the move to electric should not mean less pay. Unions raise standards across the workplaces and entire industries, pushing up wages and strengthening benefits for everyone. That's why strong unions are critical to a growing economy and growing from the middle out, the bottom up, not the top down. That's especially true as we transition to a clean energy future, which we're in the process of doing. I believe that transition should be fair and a win-win, excuse me, for auto workers and auto companies. The EU is worried about the threat to its car makers from cheaper imports from China. It says its Chinese rivals have an unfair advantage from state subsidies. European officials say this distorts the market. They've launched a major inquiry. That the Commission is launching an anti-subsidy investigation into electric vehicles coming from China. <laughs> Europe is open to competition but not for a race to the bottom. We must defend ourselves against unfair practices. And some European analysts believe the move is intended to give the EU's auto industry time to catch up with Chinese rivals. Beijing is condemning the decision, saying the inquiry is simply protectionism. What I want to emphasize is that the investigation measure that the European Union plans to take is to protect its own industry in the name of fair competition. This is blatant protectionist behavior that will seriously disrupt and distort the global automotive industrial chain and supply chain, including the European Union. It will have a negative impact on the China-EU economic and trade relations. China is by far the biggest producer of electric vehicles. Global sales have tripled in the past three years from nearly 3 million in 2020 to 10 million last year. A total of 14% of all car new cars sold were electric. That's up from 9% in 2021 or 5% in 2020. Well, that means for every 20 new cars sold last year, three were electric. And China is the clear front runner once again with nearly two thirds of all global sales. In Europe, 21% of cars sold last year were electric. In the US, it was just 8%. Although most of China's electric vehicles stay on Chinese roads, Beijing accounted for nearly a third of all global exports. Well, let's bring in our guests. We have joining us from Brussels, Stephen Erlanger, the chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe for the New York Times. In Beijing, Andy Mock, senior research fellow at the Center for China Globalization. And in Duisburg, Germany, Ferdinand Dudenhofer, professor and director at the Center for Automotive Research Think Tank. A warm welcome to you all. If I could start with Stephen in Brussels. The battle that's going on in the US right now between automakers and auto workers, will it impact how competitive the US becomes in the global EV market? It's bound to. I mean, part of what uh, the Union of Auto Workers is trying to do is to protect jobs. 
a lot of the electrical vehicle work done in the United States is being done from plants that are non-traditional, but are also non-unionized. And this is what's driving the unions crazy. Um, it is also true that electric cars require far fewer moving parts, so they will require far fewer auto workers. So part of what you have going on is an effort for the unions to preserve themselves, but also to preserve their jobs in a very quickly changing techno technological marketplace. And if the United States is going to be competitive in electrical cars, it's going to have to cut its costs. Now, we can get into the subsidy question later, but I, I, I think it's quite clear that cost is going to really matter because if everyone's going to have to buy an electric car, there's going to have to be all kinds of niches, not just the expensive cars that quite a lot of American and European electric car manufacturers seem to favor. I like the fact that you've put your finger on cost for us, Stephen. Let me take that point to Andy in Beijing. Can the U.S. catch up, however this is resolved, this strike going on in the U.S., can it catch up when, frankly, labor costs and production costs in China, many would say thanks to state subsidies, are a lot cheaper? No, I think that exactly is the existential challenge uh, facing the U.S. auto industry because it's not just the transition to EVs with its fewer parts, therefore requiring fewer workers. There's another very important technological change on the horizon, too, and that is the integration of AI and robots, uh, which will further reduce the need for human labor. And, Sammy, you're exactly right that China has a cost advantage, but we also have to recognize that it used to be uh, made in China, but increasingly, especially with EVs, it's designed in China as well. So Chinese electric vehicles are not only cost effective, uh, but they're increasingly seen as some of the best designed, uh, some of the best uh, thought out in terms of understanding consumer preferences. Uh, and Stephen mentioned niches. Uh, niches. Uh, and this is exactly what uh, some of these Chinese companies have shown a remarkable sophistication in. So I think it's going to be very, very challenging uh, for the U.S. automotive industry. Interesting point there, Ferdinand. Not only made in China, designed in China, Andy says. How did China get ahead of everyone else, especially the traditional German car makers when it comes to the EV market? It's not just China. Take Elon Musk as uh, some kind of examples who, who are similar to China. Uh, we heard uh, a few minutes ago that the cost position in electric vehicles is a very decisive thing, and uh, the Europeans and uh, the traditional uh, U.S. car makers uh, lack uh, this uh, cost effectiveness. So. If you look at it in detail, costs are linked to scales. And uh, so Chinese, for example, BYD, are very successful because they will sell 2.5 million electric vehicles this year, just one company. The same applies to Elon Musk and Tesla. He will sell about 1.8 or 1.9 million cars, just electric vehicles. So, they both have the scales. And if you've got the scales, then you have the cost advantages. The second thing is the battery. If you look at the battery, is about 40% or up to 40% of the cost of uh, the electric vehicles. And China knows the battery. China has a lot of experience. In the, 20, in the last 20 years, they built up its battery performance and its battery industry. So they have natural competitive advantages. And what they did is the same. What uh, Elon Musk did is go as fast as possible in scales. And the rest of the world, they just uh, sell about 5 to 10 or 15 percent of its volume as electric vehicles. So they miss the scales. To, be, to become competitive, it makes no sense to go into 
uh, and into uh, a, a trade war or something like that. Or Hang on, Ferdinand, be because when you talk about scales, couldn't theoretically, the US has a big market, it could have taken advantage of scale of production, right? Yes, right, absolutely. And Elon Musk is uh, using this case. However, it just started a few months ago when the Anti-Inflation Act from uh, Joe Biden was put in place. Then, with that act, the buyers of electric vehicles get, uh, get subsidies. And if you uh, give the people subsidies, then they can afford the electric vehicles, because electric vehicles at the moment are, in general, still higher priced uh, and uh, uh, have a higher price to comparable combustion engines. So the question is, uh, bring your market in a position where the scales are, and the scales are where the people uh, buy the cars. And in China, it's due to the fact that the government uh, gives each car maker since a long time state uh, subsidies if customers are buying its cars, its electric vehicles. All right, I think we can't avoid the issue of subsidies now. Damn it's me. come up with two of our guests. Let me bring Andy in and put the question this way. There may be a number of reasons why China is doing so well in the electrical vehicle market, but is also part of it subsidies. The Center for Strategic and International Studies says the Chinese government has invested at least 60 billion US dollars to support the EV industry. Well, Sammy, that was exactly the point I wanted to address, is why hasn't the US uh, been more competitive? And part of there's two reasons here, and European automakers as well. Uh, what I think is often called the innovator's dilemma, in that when you have the big three automakers as the industry incumbents, as well as uh, German car companies that are making a lot of money uh, selling internal combustion engine automobiles, it's incredibly difficult to cannibalize your existing businesses for uh, this new uh, type of technology. And we see in China, uh, of course, that the leaders like BYD, like NIO, uh, were not legacy automakers. Uh, Tesla was not either. So I think it's not surprising from this perspective. Now, when we look at the role of government, this is the other very, very important factor here, in that electric vehicles are not just standalone products. They're actually a, a new technology ecosystem, because you need charging stations. You know, there's other uh, things that need to be developed, R&D and batteries. Um, and what China is very good at is uh, setting long-term goals and marshalling the resources, including financial resources, uh, legislation, et cetera, at every level of government, from the national level to the provincial level to the municipal level, even down to the neighborhood level. So the last few years, uh, there are charging stations everywhere. Uh, in China. And think about this. If you have the best, cheapest electric vehicle in the world, but you have nowhere to charge it, it's not very useful. So uh, this is very important, the role of government. And this is where I think certainly the U.S., with its structure of government, makes it difficult, if not impossible, to manage these uh, shifts uh, in technology and ecosystems. OK, that's a good point. Let's take it back to Stephen, then. Can one blame China if China has planned its EV market in advance of everyone, given support in advance of everyone, while in some countries, the petro-related industries, if we can call them that, and the internal combustion engine interest lobbies, kept the transition back? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we're talking about blame. We're just talking about how it's evolved. I think the Chinese should get quite a lot of credit. And also, one should understand, China has a big uh, sustainability climate problem. And so putting electric cars in the hands of Chinese consumers as fast as possible, particularly since many of them didn't have cars before, makes a great deal of sense. Um, so all, all credit to China. Um, and of course, the subsidies, as you know, work both ways because Western countries are subsidizing consumers for buying electric cars anyway. So it's not the same kind of subsidy. In a way, 
subsidies to industry are probably more efficient if you're trying to build up industry. But there are obviously subsidies on on both sides. My my guess is that given the size of of the United States market, it will manage to catch up, partly because it's taking climate more and more seriously. But as one of your guests said, when Biden passed the Inflation Reduction Act, suddenly you had the feeling that the government was really behind this transition. Uh, Europeans complained about it, obviously, um, because they thought it was trying to seduce their own indus industrial champions. But the fact of the matter is it was a very important bill for green energy transition. And Germany itself has a big problem. Stephen, how, I, how I will think, the U.S. catch up, sorry. though? How will it catch up? Well, it's got is it going to get into the subsidy game? Is it going to... <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm not to work. I mean, it's a market, and it's a market that will be increasingly forced to go electric. So when that happens, market forces mm -hmm. actually do work, in my view. We'll see. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it's not a matter of catching up or, or, or not catching up. It's a matter of building an industry that, as, as um, your colleague in um, Duisburg said, builds to scale and makes things affordable for the good of everyone. Talking of our colleague in Duisburg, let's go with the Ferdinand. So, Ferdi, is a global trade battle looming, at least between the EU and China, over this issue of subsidies? It seems to be because uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the president of uh, the EU Commission, claimed uh, that... Uh, She's going into a study to uh, look after subsidies uh, which are unfair, which uh, the Chinese government do for its industry. She gave the public no proof, just came up with a statement. We think there are unfair competition methods, but and not any proof. Nobody can understand such a, such a such a statement. Why doesn't he come with proofs up? Um, so uh, my feeling is, uh, look, uh, if you look at Europe, we have the French people and uh, we have uh, Monsieur uh, Macron, which is president in France, and Macron was responsible that uh, Ursula von der Leyen went become uh, became uh, EU uh, president. Uh, the French automotive industry is very, very weak in China. They have, in principle, no sales. They are not visible. So for France, there is no risk if uh, we in Europe uh, install uh, trade barriers and tariffs against the Chinese. They can't lose anything. They can just win uh, due to the fact that they can sell its more uh, uh, priced, higher priced vehicles to but the But the customers. Germans would lose, right, Ferdi? Because Volkswagen manufactures, the biggest uh, uh, European car absolutely. maker, manufactures EVs, electric vehicles in China, right? So is there real unity, Ferdi, within the EU over even uh, this question of a trade battle over uh, subsidies? Absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, the German car makers, uh, even uh, BMW and Mercedes, they uh, sell about 30 to 40 percent of its worldwide sales in China. So the, the big risk in, into going in a trade war. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the strange thing is that our secretary of, uh, of economics, uh, Mr. Harvick, told the public, I think it's a good thing that uh, the EU Commission will do an analysis. Nobody understands that because it's a big risk for the, ter for, for the German car industry. And to be honest, uh, you can be better if you make barriers. You will be better if you come up um, with more competition and go up in scales and not in trade barriers. So uh, we in Europe uh, face a big problem. And it could be that Europe is going into a trade war against China. This could be the next steps, like Donald Trump did it some years ago. Andy, do you share that perspective? Is a trade war really possible, given how integrated the car, the EV car market is? I mean, both the biggest, the biggest manufacturers in Europe for EV 
vehicles and in the US, they manufacture in China too. Trade barriers will be very bad business for them. Well, I think on any rational basis, uh, we can say that yes, a trade war would be a very bad thing, and yet they still do happen. But I also want to point out here that we have to also consider different constituencies. So um, if climate change is as dire a threat as uh, many governments, many people, many multilateral organizations like the United Nations believes, uh, by slowing down the adoption of EVs, in fact, uh, Europe and the United States are really undermining uh, global welfare. And Stephen's point, I think the best thing for the United States would be to allow Chinese EVs into the market. That would be best for American consumers. They would have inexpensive, safe, uh, and well-designed electric vehicles that are good for the planet. Um, now, of course, this would probably not be so good for some of the uh, incumbent American automakers. Uh, but again, politics is all about prioritizing. And if indeed uh, climate change is such a big threat, shouldn't uh, governments around the world be doing what they can uh, to uh, achieve carbon neutrality and other uh, goals that make it a more sustainable planet possible? A more sustainable planet, of course, runs up against the issue of human beings being selfish, and they always want to be each nation at the head of that, don't they? Let's bring in Stephen once again into this. Yes, because there's also a question of politics, right? I mean, Joe Biden is running for re-election. If he wants to be re-elected, he needs the votes, as he won last time, of American working class men and women and they are represented by unions often and by the, UA, the UAW. So Biden is trying with laws like the IRA to promote green practices, but he also finds politics means, you know, he considers himself, he portrays himself as the defender of America's middle class. It has a foreign policy for the middle class. He's a big union guy. So naturally, he's going to support the UAW. I'm not sure we need to get into a trade war, but I, I have the sense what the EU is really trying to do is buy time for mm. its own domestic industries to try to catch up, to reduce their dependency on China, not so much for Finnish cars, but for batteries. I mean, China, you know, if you believe some figures, produces 75 percent of all the world's car batteries. So um, European industry was slow to get started. I think German car industry was great at making last century's cars. It's been slow at, at, at learning how to make good electric cars, digital cars, AI cars. And it needs to try to catch up. And I think that's what the EU is trying to, to do, which will require, I think, a little bit of protectionism. I think that word's valid. It's like you read my mind again, Stephen, because I'm glad you, you mentioned batteries. Can the US and Europe really catch up on batteries, particularly Europe, Ferdy? Uh, we know the largest manufacturer in Europe building six gigafactories across Europe and I think one in China to try and create its own supply chain. Is it yes. too late? No, it's not too late. It's the same what BYD did in China. Uh, so VW will do that uh, with its uh, subsidiary, which is called PowerCo. Uh, but uh, see, uh, it makes no sense to go in conflict, in contrast with each other. Uh, in Germany, CRTL, which is the largest battery maker in the world, a Chinese battery maker, uh, has built up a plant near Weimar, and they produce cells for the German car industry. So it would be very interesting to go in corporations, in corporations with Chinese companies and corporations with European and U U.S. companies to form, to form a new uh, area.
in which uh, in which cost effectiveness in the battery uh, field uh, will be uh, interesting. See, uh, VW, for example, has a link to uh, to Goshen, which is a Chinese company doing batteries. So they work together. Why shouldn't we work together? Just uh, in case and not uh, going into for confrontation, say, oh, this is a Chinese battery, this is a US battery, we need a uh, European battery. We need a battery in which. Because, uh, Ferdy, at times of crunch, here's the counter opinion, because at times of crunch, as we saw with the microchip uh, whole supply chain incident, sometimes countries do prioritize their own national production over others. Let me take that point since I think we got on a minute, Andy. I mean, we're hearing sensible sentiment from Ferdy, but is it is it likely? Well, that's the challenge and the opportunity. So certainly, like with semiconductors, uh, that countries uh, see this as a uh, a national security issue, at least in part. So if we look at batteries as well, they have both civilian Are batteries as well likely as to be considered the same uses, way, so. Andy, because they're the most important component, definitely in EV production, arguably in, in other parts of our electric future? Absolutely. So again, I think this makes this uh, very challenging to resolve, that uh, it's both a challenge and an opportunity that, on the one hand, consumers, of course, want uh, good products at reasonable prices. Uh, certain products, certain inputs, like semiconductors, I think like batteries, also have national security implications as well. So I think each country has to decide how to balance that. And it's a very difficult balance, um, as we're seeing. All right, let me uh, bring in Stephen then. Uh... Are we going to see, perhaps, regions try and focus on different segments of the market? U.S. manufacturers try and capture maybe the SUV and truck markets, whereas Europe focus on the range of luxury brands it has and so on. That would be logical. I mean, that seems to me where, where we're actually going. But, I mean, it is a technological revolution. There's a lot of chaos. Things will have to shake out. There's an awful lot of competition. Tesla's feeling it now, too. So I, it's, it's very hard to predict. I think rationality in this market is to be hoped for, but not to be expected. OK, that's an interesting line, I think, to end the show on. Let's thank our guests for all their contributions, Stephen Erlanger, Andy Mock and Ferdinand Dudenhofer. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X, formerly known as Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here for now, it's goodbye.